Okay. Hi, Lindsay. Oh, hi, Moby. We're recording, and this is a very exciting, extra special episode. And do you know why it's a very exciting, extra special episode? I do, but I think that you should say it out loud. Okay, because this is our one year Moby Pod anniversary episode. It's very, very exciting. I can't believe it's been a year. Time flies when you're having fun. And I really actually mean that because it's been very fun. It has been very fun. And I was looking back at the list of all the people we've talked to and all the things we've talked about. And it it's so eclectic. Mm-hmm. And I, don't, I, I, I personally think that's a good thing. Oh, yeah. I hope you think it's a good thing. Oh, it's great. Is I mean, that a that, leading question on my part? I probably is a leading question. A like bit. it would not be allowed in a court of law to say like, I think this happened. Do you think it happened? Like <laughs> I'd be a terrible trial lawyer. <laughs> but I would, I would love to watch it. You know, I love watching trials. Okay. Suits. That was a Suits reference. Yeah. Uh, so um, <laughs> I haven't seen Suits. So I w- apart from the lady who no longer is part of the royal fam Megan Megan Markle. Markle okay hi bagel so any case not to go on a suit tangent because i've never seen it <laughs> uh it's been 1 year which on one hand isn't a lot of time and especially as i've come to understand the podcast world more a year is nothing like we're infants mm, like yeah. there are all these podcast people out there who we talk to who've been doing it for like 10 years yeah, and it's longer crazy. so like we're still Babies. We're still a little baby pod. Uh, <laughs> but nonetheless, I, as I was saying, I really had this moment when I was looking back at all the people we've spoken to and all the strange things we've covered. And it, it, I love that it, it makes no sense, which in a way makes, at least for me, perfect sense. Well, that was a little bit what we set out to do. I remember when we were first talking about the podcast and... We had we had a bunch of bagel. ideas that were very specific. Do you remember? Think bagel should come sit next to you. Well, yeah, of course. Bagel, come here. Come sit here. She's very, very feeling very independent. She has right her now. own camera right now. I know. And I feel bad that come like here, the bagel cam is just showing. She'll, she'll come eventually oh. when she's ready. Okay. Hi, bags. Wow, yeah. bagel. She's still in showing mode. Yeah. So, sorry, you were saying. Okay, I was saying. I think what we set out to do. And we we came up with all of these very specific ideas of let's do a podcast that's just about creativity or that's just about animal rights or that's just about any of the things that we care so much about. But then you said something that I initially didn't really understand, which was let's just do whatever we want. Let's just leave it wide open. Let's make it as broad as possible so that we leave ourselves open to talk about whatever, whenever. And at first I was like, no, it's chaos. But it's actually been, I think, the best part of doing this podcast is that we can talk about whatever moves us. And it's it's so... It's so fun and leaves us... I mean, we can be as creative or stupid or smart as we want. We can have anyone that we find interesting or that we really love to come on the podcast. So I, I think it's an awesome thing. Yeah, and also... I will say, and we've talked about this before, how surprised I've been that, and I, I'm going to, this might sound like hyperbole or I'm overstating something, but that there's something sort of potentially profound about podcasting. Uh, and what I mean by that is, as we've said, <laughs> like you have conversations with people you've either never met before. Or people you know, but have never had an in-depth conversation with. Like some of the people we've had on the podcast, like Steve-O, Hunter, Dan Buettner, Ed Begley. Like people I've known. Even Lisa Edelstein. People I've known for quite a long time. But for the most part, my conversations with them socially tend to be kind of light and fun. Just like, hey, what's going on? Do you want to go order onion rings from Hugo's or something like just, and you don't get to go in depth about your own experiences and really ask and listen. It's such a, it's this little container yeah. that we have here. And I've been really surprised by that aspect mm-hmm. of it. The, and it might sound like I'm being overly dramatic, but yeah, the, the, the potential for profundity is been really surprising and wonderful. Mm-hmm. And also because It's one of the only times, at least in my life, where you have a long conversation 
And for the most part, you don't interrupt the other person. Like you, yeah. it's that when one person is speaking, everyone listens. Mm -hmm. And everyone, and when, as a result, when people are speaking, especially because they know it's being recorded, they try, it's a chance for them to sort of say things that are more earnest and more thoughtful that otherwise they might not ever have a chance to talk about. Yeah, um, I completely agree. So also, I'm aware of something. What? That I think, at least I think I'm aware of something did you write an epic poem about our one year Moby Pod anniversary? I did. I really wrote a poem. Okay. And it, it reads like a children's book. And I don't know how epic it is, but it does exist. Let's and just, you know what? I had a lovely time writing it. In the in this era of overstatement and self-promotion, let's just say that you've written the greatest epic poem that's ever <laughs> existed. Keeping in mind, I haven't read it yet nor have i heard it but i would love if you would share your one year moby pod anniversary epic poem with me and bagel and, and mike. mike Fermansky, who's sitting over there in the corner okay great and also oh, what, are you, ideally, what are you doing babe? bagel what are you, what are you doing oh hmm. parkour um I've also we set up this fancy bagel cam and she doesn't want to sit in her spot and she hasn't used it once she will She'll bagel, be back. Go, she always go, comes back. In your spot? You, come your here, mom, your bagel. Your mom's going to talk about. <laughs> your mom's going to. Bagel, come read, here, boo boo. She's greatest. so excited today. Yeah. Okay, so do you want to read your epic poem specifically for me and Bagel and everyone listening? Specifically? Yes. Yeah. Um, I do. I do. Okay. Are you ready? Yes. Bagel, are you ready? Because you, you're being a little crazy. Okay, why don't you sit down? Can you lay down, Bagel? There you go. Can you just lay? Oh. Can you? There we go. Can you sit here? She's so, she, her tail's wagging okay. like crazy. Yeah. Okay. <sighs> All right, I want her to settle first because I'm, not going, I get so distracted. We're going to be so here for the next three hours waiting for her to settle. Bagel. She's just, everything's exciting. I'm going to put on my reading glasses. Okay. Oh, God, that's so much better. Okay. Okay, it's poem time. Lindsay Hicks. Epic poem about one year of doing Moby Pod. Here we go. 365 short days ago. So far, so good. Lindsay. Sorry, I won't interrupt. Okay, I'm going to stop. <laughs> okay, okay. Please start from the beginning. Okay. 365 short days ago, Lindsay and Bagel approached their friend, Mo. The people need more than just your great songs. Your voice has a place in the podcasting throngs. So Moby considered, but at first he doubted. Why take up more space in a, in a place that's so crowded? But Lindsay and Bagel pushed him to try it. You've got cool things to say. No need to keep quiet. <laughs> uh, I hate my laugh. No, keep going. <laughs> we wanted to start with something quite showy, so we kicked the pot off with tales about Bowie. I guess it was stressful to enter the fray, so next up was some tips for our anxiety. Our film punk rock vegan movie had just graced the screen, so we spoke to its star, the great Derek Green. Next was the actor, New York's party queen, the prolific painter, Lisa Edelstein. When fiending for fighting, a fact war was waged. Just a few battles, but more will be staged. Then there was the time demons damaged our mic. Rachel Stavis fought back with a light counterstrike. If you want to live healthier long past 100, Dan Butner can help, and his hotness abundant. <laughs> um, if you want to make choices for a better planet, Ed Bagley Jr. is here to help you plan it. Okay. <laughs> okay. We covered remixes and ambient music. If it makes a sound, Moby can produce it. There was quantum mechanics and bad pickup lines. We even took a journey through Moe's vegan time. The soft side of Steve-O had us enamored, gentle and funny, and now never hammered. <laughs> 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 Peter Kalmus had once chained himself to a bank. Would you rather survive or fill your gas tank? We wrote two cool songs about sadness and crying, and one about aliens, earth occupying. Dr. Kristen Thompson preached psychiatry. We told stories of storms and sobriety. 
Our friend, our friend Gwenna Hunter makes LA way better. Her cool vegan food bank is quite the joy spreader. Nobody saves animals quite like Gene Bauer. We were so impressed with his compassionate power. You'd think the next guest was demonic Poseidon, but he's just a sober civilian, our friend Hunter Biden. We had so much fun with the sweet Ashley Jackson, a busy Gen Zer. Can't catch her relaxing. <laughs> <laughs> we chose meditation to end 23 shockingly thankful bagel moby and me while we hoped moby pod would inspire and beguile it's our listeners who've joined us that made it all worthwhile wow i almost feel like we should add some sort of like applause <laughs> sound effect so in the end so can we please add I'm speaking to Jonathan in Texas who edits this. Jonathan, can we please add some applause for Lindsay's epic poem? Make it like a stadium. Like yeah, a stadium or, or, or like the end of an opera. Like like, like the <laughs> yeah. Metropolitan Opera House. Like a thousand people <laughs> whistling and yelling bravo because that was on. That was great. Really? Yeah. Thanks. I mean, some of the rhymes, maybe I like. Did you like when I, when I rhymed planet with plan it? Yeah. I don't know if that's, yeah, I guess that's a rhyme or is that a pun or is that wordplay? I don't really know. The I Dan also tried the to, to um, rhyme a h rhyme hundred with abundant. Do you know, there were some moments that weren't A plus, but overall everything was perfect. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> I also rhymed fray with anxiety. Yeah, that's. That's one of my personal favorites. Um, it was really great. Thank Thanks. you for <laughs> summing up a year of Moby Pod in one epic poem that is the greatest epic poem ever written <laughs> um bagel slowly moving towards her bagel can she's getting there do you think she, but she wants has she wants to be sure she sees you hi bagel hi uh okay so moving on um i thought it might be interesting to talk about our most distinct memories of each guest great let's do it i love that idea okay so should we start? Do you want to go in order? Because yeah, I've got our little list here. Yeah, let's let's start. Let's start one year ago with our very first guest, and for each guest, we'll just talk about some impression, some memory, something that surprised us, or or I don't know. Because everybody, luckily, I mean, we haven't had any stinkers. Everybody's been great. Everyone's been so awesome. We've been really, really lucky. Okay. So, um, so our first guest. Which I remember I was so nervous when we had him over. And remember we recorded outside. Mm -hmm. We were so crazy. <laughs> um, was Derek Green. So Derek Green, uh, he's the singer from Sepultura. And he grew up in the hardcore punk scene. And he's one of the most insightful special voices in punk rock vegan movie. And I wasn't nervous to talk to Derek because I'd met Derek a bunch of times. And I knew... Yeah. He's such a wonderful contradiction because when you see him on stage, he looks like a giant demon. I mean, he's so tall and big and strong yeah. and like and beautiful. And then the sound that comes out of him is just like, but then he's the sweetest, nicest, gentlest, most thoughtful, compassionate, vegan guy. Like I remember a couple of weeks before we talked to him, he and I think his nieces had gone to the Hollywood Bowl for a Disney sing-along night. Yeah, that's... And so he's on social media, like, singing along to Frozen with his nieces. God, that's like, cute. So juxtaposing that with this six-foot-five huge rock star demon on stage yeah. and the fact that he's such an insightful compassionate animal rights activist. So yeah. I, I think if you're for starting off our Moby Pod, that That was a big that was a big kickoff. I love I love that. Was that was a really yeah. good and one. And also sort of just indicated like one of the goals is to talk to people in a way that might be surprising. Like to yeah. show to show aspects of people that people listening wouldn't otherwise expect. Mm -hmm. Okay, so is Lisa next? Then Lisa was our second guest. So Lisa, I've known Lisa for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And Lisa has sort of had three lives. Her first life, which we talked about, was she was the queen of the club kids mm -hmm. in New York in the 80s. 
you know, Lisa E. And she was like on the cover of fanzines and was out every single night at the limelight. And she was legendary. People yeah. know. I mean, she was a big deal, Lisa E. Um, and then, obviously, she transitioned that into a remarkable acting career. Unbelievable. And it's been, I mean, okay, I you you might know this better than I do, but obviously she was in House. Um, I believe she's in... Uh, Girlfriend's Guide to Divorce. Girlfriend's Guide to Divorce. Which I watched over the pandemic, and boy, was that is that a it's delightful, delightful TV show. Um, the West Wing. Yes, she was in The West Wing. Um, I always I forget think, that. I think she was in Seinfeld. She might have had a cameo in Seinfeld. Cool. Possibly uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm. I, yeah, mean, I mean, what hasn't did, Lisa? She's done so, a gazillion things, and she's so good. But the main thing we wanted to talk about with her was her painting. Her, which, oh, my God. <laughs> to state the obvious, there's a long tradition of musicians trying to be fine artists. Yep. And for the most part, it doesn't work out too well. But in Lisa's case, when she first showed me her paintings... I remember thinking like, oh no, what if they're bad? What if they're bad? How am I going to pretend they're good? And then she showed it to me and they were so much better and deeper and darker than I had, than I had imagined. Mm -hmm. um, so it was wonderful. We talked to her about creativity. Uh, and then I believe up next is where we start to enter the realm of darkness. No, okay, Dan Butner was next. Okay, we're not entering the realm. I thought Rachel was next. Oh no, she's, she's after that. Okay, so Dan Butner. What a story. And I learned so much. I've known him for a long time, and I've learned so much about him just by sitting down doing the podcast with him. I mean, obviously talking about Blue Zones, mm -hmm. but like I'm still intimidated by every aspect of him, like riding a bicycle across the Sahara Desert, riding a bicycle from Alaska to Patagonia. It's like... Unbelievable. Like yeah. things I didn't even know was an, that you could do. <laughs> yeah. So he just so impressive and I'm so thrilled that I guess the Blue Zones has done incredibly well on Netflix um, yes it has done so well and he's all over the place I mean and preaching longevity and preaching a vegan diet mm -hmm. to anyone that'll listen and a lot of people are listening and I think it's an amazing thing and I think this is true for many people it's very hard to connect um the compassionate side that we all have to a piece of food on a plate. Like people don't connect mm -hmm. it to the animal that suffered. But I think when you recontextualize it in, do you want to have a sick and shitty end of your short life? Or do you want to feel good for so much longer? And when you put it in those terms of like you, it's up to you, you know? And, and there's one other aspect of that, uh, which is especially tragic and heartbreaking, literally and figuratively, is <laughs> in most of the Western world, people are sick and people expect to be sick. Like, I mean, I have family who live in middle America and like they're obese yeah. and they expect to be obese because everyone around them is obese. And like, if you don't have diabetes by the time you're 50, it's almost like something's wrong with you. Yeah. You know, and like, they're just... They're constantly in and out of the doctor's office getting different types of prescriptions. and But that's the status quo. And it's so tragic and heartbreaking that it doesn't have to be. And I've even had a friend of mine's brother. He's, I think, in his 30s, and he's obese and diabetic and very sick. And she went to him. She was like, you know, you could just modify your diet and probably be a lot healthier. And he got mad at her. And he was like, absolutely not. Yeah, people are very emotionally attached to their habits. It's really just, Even if it's yeah. hurting them. It's such a strange thing. So God bless Dan Butner yeah, for I think he, being an evangelist, mm -hmm. a self-evident evangelist going to people and saying, oh, if you eat better and live a healthier life, you will live a healthier life. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I had an idea. What's your idea? My idea was I'm going to take your epic poem and set it to some sort of music. And are you going to like sing it? Uh, no, doubtful. Um, I'm going to take your, po like your reading of the poem and set oh, it to music. Oh, fun. Maybe. We'll see how, I've never taken maybe, maybe an epic poem. Maybe you should sing it. <laughs> Let's see it. Okay, so when we finish this part of the recording, I'm going to take your recording of the poem and maybe I'll redo it myself with singing, but probably I think I'd rather take your version 
and orchestrate it. I don't know what that means, and I don't know if it'll work. Maybe I'll have to reread it in a more presentational fashion. Okay. And then, so at the very end of this episode, we will debut the orchestrated epic poem that you wrote. Yeah. Or keeping in mind, I've never orchestrated an epic poem. So there's a first time for everything. I might have a few different tries. Great. Like a joyful version, a somber version, an energetic version, a quiet version. Ooh, great. Yeah. We could do an ASMR version. <laughs> <laughs> you like ASMR. I love I it. I can't stand it. it oh, yeah, okay. So it's just my favorite. Agree to disagree. Just um, like San Diego and Anchorman. Yeah. Okay, so who's next? Um, my dear friend, Rachel Stavis. And this was this I would say of the year of doing Moby Pod, this was the strangest moment of all of the Moby Pods because she is a demonologist and an exorcist. And as we are interviewing her and talking about demons, there was a type of interference in her audio that I've never heard before. And so on the social Ooh, media post, scary. we had a photo of the waveform. You could We played the audio, and it was so disconcerting because I've been engineering audio for decades. I've never had that happen before. I'm talking about decades. The first time I plugged a mic cable into a microphone was probably, okay, this is going to be sad. Um, my mom used to date country western musicians. Multiple? I don't know. I mean, it was the 70s. And <laughs> she would take me to go see them in bars. So part of my childhood was spent in country western bars in Connecticut in the 70s. And I would get put to work. So I'd be like plugging mic cables into microphones when I was nine years old. So that's almost 50 years of plugging mic cables into microphones. Wow. Starting when I was nine. I've never, the first time I ever heard that distinct, inexplicable type of interference was when Rachel started talking about demons. That's so weird. Ugh. That's why, like, and and it might sound like when we, I remember when we launched that episode, I was like, are people going to think I'm just sort of making this up? Like, is this just like P.T. Barnum style showmanship? It's like, <laughs> no, I promise you. I've had microphones stop working. I've had cables stop working. I've never heard that before. Crazy. Yeah, I weird things happen around Rachel. Weird electronic technical things happen around her. I've seen it happen many times. Um but it was really fascinating having her on. And there was a strong reaction to her. A lot of people weren't happy that we did that. Or were, you know, mm -hmm. whatever. Had, they just People had strong reactions to it. But I love Rachel. Aside from being an exorcist and a demonologist, she's also a really good friend and a really good gift giver, which I think is okay. a special talent. I wouldn't know anything about that. Yeah. So, okay. So, and then because I, my memory... Was it Kirsten was next? Yes. Okay. Remember Kirsten kinda, Thompson? Pretty good, yeah. Yeah. Kirsten Thompson. So she... Dr. Kirsten Dr. Thompson. Kirsten Thompson. And what a story. Like this amazing therapist who's helped so many people and just a lovely, warm person. But also like the fact that she was supposed to start work as a financial analyst in the World Trade Center on September 11th, 2001. Shocking. I mean, What? Yeah, like her story was just so, I mean, apart from her insights as a psychiatrist and a therapist, that, that alone would have made her fascinating. But just her story was so interesting and surprising. But what a beautiful thing, because I, I think a lot about what she said of she had this experience of being there and being young and about to start start this journey and seeing people much older that seemed unhappy thinking they were about to die and it making her think is this life is short is this how I want to be living my life and she eventually got out of it and went to school to be a surgeon because she wanted to do something that made her feel fulfilled because of that experience of honoring the kind of 
the the shortness of life and and to become a yeah and then to quit being a surgeon to go back to school to get your phd in psychiatry i mean yeah how like what i mean i'm a college dropout and uh, i just again like i love these inspiring people but i do sort of feel kind of inadequate by comparison oh yeah i was like i had to like bust my ass just to get a bfa in classical theater i didn't even have a minor <laughs> <laughs> okay, so who's next? Um, next up is Steve-O. Okay, so this, I think for a lot of people, this people were very surprised that we're having Steve-O on MobyPod. Um, because, to state the obvious, Steve-O is universally, globally known as literally a jackass. Yeah, he's a, he's a clown. And he went to clown school. And yeah. he's known for being this goofball like who gets a tattoo of himself on his back while he's riding <laughs> dune buggies and like i mean the stuff they came up with to yeah. do was just like so dangerous and absurd and some often hilarious but, um but people make the assumption that's who he is yeah he's and just this i've known steve-o weirdly enough we're bo we're both sort of from Derry and connecticut but i've known steve-o on and off for quite a while and I did his podcast, and we had the most thoughtful, deep conversation about sobriety and spirituality. And so that's why I wanted him to come on ours, not to talk about, like, what's it like to get tattooed in the back of a dune buggy, <laughs> but what's your journey towards having a spiritual life? What's your journey towards sobriety? And it was, I, I don't know, because I don't like to read comments because they make me scared. Um, but I did have some people reach out to me saying, wow, I never expected him to be so like gentle and thoughtful. He, I mean, that was my experience because I had never, I had never met him before we had him over and, you know, I grew up watching him be this insane person on TV. A jackass. Yeah. And I was so so taken with his kind of his gentleness and how he loves his partner and he just wants to like live this life and find ways to be creative but also to like help people and support people on their spiritual sober journey i mean it's and, just it's a beautiful thing and i mean you would think i mean so many people their goals involve like making a ton of money with crypto or becoming commercial real estate investors or becoming an influencer who makes a sex tape. His goal is to open an animal sanctuary. Yeah. And that's just like so surprising and wonderful. And it's really going back to what we were talking about earlier. I love seeing these sides of people that are so inspiring and thoughtful and yeah, it's, I'm just grateful. Like, even if no one was listening, I just think we've had a year of just, I don't know, amazing contact with, with surprisingly special people. Surprisingly special people like Peter Kalmus. Okay. So I have never met Peter in person. Uh, I think he's the only remote interview we've done mm -hmm. because he's in North Carolina. And I discovered Peter Kalmus on social media because he's this outspoken climate scientist. And I've been, like most people, interested in climate change for a long time. Like I had a conversation with Al Gore decades ago, and I asked Al Gore about meat and dairy production and climate change. And Al Gore said famously to me, he said, oh, well, the role of meat and dairy production in climate change is the real inconvenient truth. So... I've been following climate scientists on social media and climate activists, and Peter Kalmus was just the top of the heap. Yeah. So smart, you know, I think multiple PhDs, mm -hmm. but he also, he walks the walk and he goes out and he protests and gets arrested and he doesn't mince his words about climate change because there yeah. is, I'm stating the obvious, but there is a tendency or propensity that a lot of people have to talk about climate change as if we can respond to it in our own sweet time. Right. But there's, he brings this sense of urgency in a way that I think a lot of other people don't quite do. 
it's amazing how he has no fear. He doesn't yeah. care if it spooks people or scares people. He's like, you, we, sh- we should be having a real reaction, real response if it makes us do something about it. I mean, it, the analogy for me is like, if someone's house is on fire, do you politely let them know that they might want to think about addressing the fact right. that their house is on fire? Or do you scream at the top of your lungs, hey, your house is on fire. The only home you have is about to disappear. And so his response is inspiring, but it's also when you take a step back, you're like, that's how we should all be responding. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Okay, well, yeah, he was... He was... I, I, I felt so lucky yeah. that we got that time with him. Me too. It was. It's one of my favorite episodes, only because I feel like it's so. It was so important mm-hmm. and so timely. And I hope that we can. I mean, maybe we have him on again. But I think people of that nature that are preaching things that could potentially save our species, like maybe more of that. Yeah. Um, our next person was Gwenna Hunter. Okay. So speaking of magical human beings, yeah. so we have for a while been trying to work on a documentary about the animal safe movement. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're hopefully going to be launching that in some form in 2024. But In one form or another, yeah. maybe an unexpected form. And so Gwenna, we met her because we interviewed her about her experience at Animal Save. And I don't know if you, I mean, I'm... I don't want to speak for both of us, but my reaction was when she started talking, she spoke about animals and the suffering of animals and meat and dairy production and bearing witness just in a way that I'd never heard anyone talk. Like, because it was personal and deeply emotional and Mm -hmm. spiritual in a very ancient sort of way. Like, it felt, I, I felt, like, I remember when we were interviewing her, I was getting choked up and I felt like... I don't know. It felt like I was in a different time and place. Me too. I, what what I because I think a lot of animal activists because you know we see so much awful stuff all the time that and I know I mean I'll speak for myself. I think I disconnect emotion from it because I just can't. I just can't mm-hmm. handle it. If I connected mo- emotion to my animal activism every day, I would just be so depleted because it's so. I mean the emotion is so huge and so big and the fear and the, all of those feelings are so big. But something that really struck me about Gwenda when we interviewed her for that thing was how connected her emotions were to the experience of being an animal activist and the mm-hmm. way that she commute. I, I mean, it was, I, everyone in the room was emotional and had tears yeah. in their eyes while she was talking. And this, the strength, I mean, it's, you know, we sort of live in this world and I'm stating the obvious where people think that, vulnerability is a weakness. Mm -hmm. You know, we live in this bellicose age where people think that, you know, like yelling and being tough, like that's strength. Mm -hmm. And what people like Gwenna show me are like, no, vulnerability is a strength. And it's terrifying as well to like inhabit, honestly inhabit that vulnerable place is so strong and so challenging. So yeah, that was, again, Everyone we've spoken to, I've been honored to have on, but her in particular, I felt like it was like we had a visit from an ancient goddess who I came know. to visit us from a time portal. Yeah, there is a beautiful depth in Gwena, and it was so great having her on. Um, our next person was also a very inspiring person who's also a major hottie, <laughs> which is uh, Jean Bauer. So Jean... Uh, for people who might not be aware, he started Farm Sanctuary, you know, one of the first farm animal sanctuaries and rescue organizations. He's also at present, and I'm sure there are other people, but he's the only person I know who's been vegan longer than I have, mm. um, which I both love and maybe a little bit resent him for. <laughs> and similar to Dan Butner, he's just this superman. Like, he jogs to the top of mountains. Doesn't walk, doesn't I mean, hike to the top of mountains. He jogs to the top of mountains. He does ultra marathons while he's not running Farm Sanctuary and lobbying Congress and saving the world. So that he was our first two-part episode just because we had such a long 
in-depth special conversation with him and his mm -hmm. place in the animal rights movement is so legendary and iconic yep he is iconic. I, I mean, he's one of the people that when we first started talking about doing a podcast was one of the first names I ever mentioned just because of how much he's given yeah. to this movement. I mean, it's, it's kind of unbelievable. And his ninja power of being sort of like humble and gentle and sort of soft-spoken, but so intelligent and mm -hmm. so insightful. Like mm -hmm. if you talk to him, in passing, you could sort of think he seems like just very, just very gentle. Mm -hmm. But then you realize like, oh, there is like steel and persistence underneath that. Yep. So, and I sort of love the provincial aspect is that he grew up, so you live a mile away from me mm -hmm. and he grew up right in between where we live. Mm -hmm. So the fact that he was able to like walk down from his parents' house yeah. to do our podcast that was just felt like you walked over with bagel he walked over from his parents house like it felt like we were just like pals meeting up in the neighborhood yeah yeah no it was it was so awesome having him and i loved the way that those episodes turned out okay so i think yes we're up to the we're up to the, the lunatic big guns episodes that so this Hunter Biden was next, right? Yes, Hunter Biden. And so this, I mean, again, I keep saying this, but everybody we've spoken to has been surprising and special. Mm -hmm. One of the things that made me so, there are a bunch of things that made me excited to talk to Hunter. It was also our second two-part episode. One was he is one of the most well-known people on the planet, and he's so demonized, vilified, even progressives vilify him. But like mm -hmm. on the right, they see him as this mastermind, evil, demonic figure. I mean, figure. the stories that are out yeah. there about Hunter are so out of left field. And yes, this is a man who has made mistakes that I think he has owned up to and has worked very, very hard to make amends and live a better life as we spoke about on the podcast but god the feedback on that of how how strongly especially um conservatives respond to him i mean i, I, I such vitriolic anger and, and at the, him and the contrast and this this made me so happy to be able and, and I, I went on cnn to talk about this episode and I think the journalist was disappointed because they wanted me to feed the flames. They wanted me to yeah. create something salacious and TMZ worthy. <laughs> and I was like, Hunter's my friend. He spends his days making beautiful, gentle paintings and drinking bad coffee and hanging out with his wife and his son. And he is funny and humble and caring. Like, the contrast between how the right and Trump and these people have vilified him and who he actually is, the fact that we were able to show that, mm -hmm. one, I felt like I just, he's my friend and I really wanted people to get a chance to meet him. You know, yeah. not how he's portrayed in the media, but to meet him, but also hopefully in our own very small way to sort of point a little bit of a finger at this culture of hatred that exists mm. especially i'm really thrilled and we didn't talk about this that much but that we were able to launch his episodes in december which for me was very intentional because for a lot of religious traditions that's the most spiritual time of the year yes you know? it's a time of community family gratitude yep. warmth and i just don't know any spiritual tradition that says you should condemn and judge people you've never met and never spoken to. Like where, where, like all these Christians, these Republican Christians, these right-wing Christians who claim to be like working on behalf of Christianity, like show me in the New Testament where it says you're supposed to hate and judge strangers. Especially based on, based on hearsay, yeah. based on things that you don't know if it's true or not, but you decide it's true because it fits your narrative of a it's president a, that you don't like because of reasons that were preached to you on some weird... I mean, there's another 
way to describe what you just politely referenced. It's a lie. They're lying. They're, yeah, like, so, it's lies. So, so where I'm going <laughs> to add that to my my Jesus question. Like, where in the New Testament did Jesus say to his followers, "You should lie about people you've never met and make sure that you hate them and promote violence against them, all based on lies and falsehood." Like, there's I I'm I'm not a big fan of like sort of binary deities, but that does seem like it's a little more demonic and devilish than anything to do with an actual like Judeo-Christian spiritual tradition. I couldn't agree more. I also, something I'm thinking about because we were just talking earlier about how now the right is saying that Taylor Swift is <laughs> a left wing demon who is a deep state plant and it's all kind of this contrived thing and it's there's some mastermind evil mastermind kind of pulling the strings and i think that hunter is a little bit wrapped up in that narrative of there is some you know secret cabal making all of these plans to do something bad i don't really understand what what the ultimate goal of the it, secret it's very confusing, and it used to be very easy to dismiss that crazy right-wing narrative when it was just like a few lunatics like standing on street corners. But now it's 45% of the population of the United States. Like Trump is currently in the lead. I mean, it's um, I, I hope shocking. One thing, and I know that politics can annoy people, um, but I do think it's our responsibility this year to try and do at least a few episodes that address... About the state of the political yeah. landscape. Especially, sorry for rambling on too much, but especially because so many progressives and Democrats are planning on not voting. Or they're going to vote for RFK Jr. Or they're, <sighs> like, I'm like... Uh, a third party candidate would be great if it was viable, but as we saw with Ralph Nader... As we saw in the last election with Jill Stein, like a third party candidate guarantees that the Republican's going to win. And it's just, it's, yes. and I know that people might get mad at me for saying that, but like, it's just empirically supported truth. <gasps> yep. <sighs> and it's also, I think this is something that I have always hoped to accomplish with this podcast is to promote gentleness and creativity and compassion and thoughtfulness and a more peaceful, fruitful way of living. And I think that so much of politics has is so is so far from mo removed from anything that even remotely looks like peace or or a fruitful life. Well, it's interesting you say that because something I've become more aware of recently is like, so I have a lot of cognitive dissonance around the culture in which we live, as I'm sure you do as well, as I'm sure do the pe people listening. But one thing I was texting with my friend Charlotte, and we've been sort of just like feeling this like, what is going on? And what we realized is a lot of our perspective, and forgive me if this sounds immodest, but a lot of our perspective, it's rational. And it's just supported by evidence. Like the idea that not killing people with guns is better than killing people with guns. The idea that climate change is real just makes sense because that's what scientists and evidence say. You know, on and on again, like it's just like we have kind of empirically supported rational perspectives. And when the other side invents their perspectives, it's hard to like, it's almost like we're trained to respect diverging opinions. We're trained to tolerate other people's perspectives. I'm like, yeah, but what about when they're wrong? What about when their, their beliefs are not based on anything other than convenient narratives shared by lunatics? Like, But it's also so many of their perspectives are just outright violent and yeah. deadly. And it is, I, I saw this this report of this, I don't remember what the percentage is, but some huge percentage leap in pregnancies from rapes and women that have died from not being able to abort deadly pregnancies. Like, yeah. because of right-wing policy 
that now all of these women are dying and forced to do things that they don't want to. It's like that is violent. That is deadly. And that is their policy. And it just doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, that's it's. Yeah. And it's so confusing trying. That's what I mean, like the sort of synaptic cognitive gulf of like, how do we make sense of it? I just can't process it. And, it's hard to look at. And it's so hard I, to think about. And I would say, presumptuously in our own tiny way, like Moby Pod, like, yeah, we've talked to people and shown people who they are, show their vulnerability, show, show them when they're being inspiring, show them when they're being honest, show people who are out there day to day trying to actually change things for the better. And that's, you know, I, I think it's nice to create this little micro, like utopian microcosm. Yeah. I think so, too. Um, it's the, you know, we're just creating the world we want to live in. And so we're up to our last guest of the no, year. We no, we have two more. Oh, that's right. I forgot. Okay. Yeah, because we had one. Because that was we were your, supposed your, to, yeah. We had your COVID guest. So, yes. So Lindsay had COVID. And as a result, um, so Ashley Jackson was supposed to be the first guest of the new year after our anniversary episode. And she was instead the last guest of the first year, if that well, makes any sense. Well, the last guest of our, yeah. 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 And so we had Ed Begley. Ed, beautiful, wonderful, sweet Ed. He came over with soup. He's, his stories about old Hollywood were phenomenal. And also his journey to sobriety, his journey to veganism, his, I mean, in terms of like environmental activism, no one I can think of has walked the walk more than Ed. Yep. Every single aspect of his life is driven toward drawing awareness to the environmental hellscape that we're living yeah. in, but also to living a more thoughtful, compassionate life. And I mean, he's also just so nice. Yep. What a what a what a kind person I'm taking public transit to the academy awards I mean, I mean like yeah like we've been so lucky i'm so grateful for the people we've had on me too and then wrapping it up with ashley jackson uh the daughter of reverend jesse jackson and ashley before she came over here we had never met her mm -hmm. almost everybody else on the podcast we had communicated with or been old friends with um and ashley we'd, we'd never met ashley we we're like uh-oh What's going to happen? Like, like this is, gonna, is this going to be good? Is this going to be bad? Are we going to... And she's my favorite person. I mean, we were just... What a delightful time we had with her. It was like sitting with an old friend, even though we had yeah. just met. I just... I enjoyed her so much. We're actual friends now. And she... I mean, her story is great. She's so inspiring. I think we've both said on multiple occasions that she gives us both hope for the future of human beings. I mean, it's it's easy. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I look at, and again, I don't want to generalize too much, but sometimes I look at like Gen Z culture and I'm like, uh-oh, like, do they not know that like they have to vote? Do they not know that like climate change is real and being an influencer is not? Like, do they not know how dire, and of course they do. I'm, 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 you know, it's not like Gen Z have their head in the sands, but it seems like sometimes I'll look on TikTok and I'll be like, oh boy, look at all these distractions and who's paying attention to the actual problems. Mm -hmm. And then you meet Ashley Jackson and you realize, oh, Gen Z, like there are some super inspiring, smart, remarkable oh, yeah. people like her. So yeah, to your point, she absolutely gave me hope for future generations, assuming they can figure out how to fix all of our problems and mistakes. Yeah, we really put them in a bad, in a bad place. Okay. Um, but yeah, she was so great. And then, yeah, that's, that's all of our guests. And so now I want to do something that was, um, and I hope that going through our year of guests has been interesting. It certainly was for me, but um, <laughs> definitely we, we went into a slightly more earnest, emphatic tone. Yes. Because sometimes you and I are inclined towards being a little bit ridiculous. Mm -hmm. In the last, going through all the guests, we were not too ridiculous. Not No. Well, also, I take our guests very seriously yeah, because too. they're really cool. And it's an honor to have them on the show. Yes. But now- But I we, don't take us very seriously. <laughs> as you shouldn't. Yeah. Can we go 
and do something a little more ridiculous. Uh, yeah. Which is, so you have some listener mail. I and, do, and I do. And I have, while you were getting listener mail, I actually reached out to some of our friends and asked them for some questions. Okay, that's exciting. So do you want, should I go first with um, our listener questions? Or do I, can I go with, there's one in particular, one of our friends had a very great request, possibly, I'm going to hope it's just for you. Okay, what is it? Okay, someone, I don't want to name names, but let's say his name rhymes with Bobbert. Um, Robert he Russell. <laughs> said, I love Moby Pod, but why isn't there more choreography And I just, well, I mean, obviously the first question is, well, because it's primarily something people listen to and choreography doesn't work too well, but nonetheless, we do film the- We do film. I mean, we could do some choreography right now. Mm, Maybe we think about it and maybe for a future (laughs) episode. I'm just saying um, his question- I'm actually a great choreographer. Some people don't know that about me. Okay, so a future episode in for Bobert's- uh, per his request, we're gonna bagel. Come over here. Come so, over. is it choreography that like I will, I will, I will come up with the choreography and I will teach it to you, and you will do the dance? He just said, "Why isn't there more choreography and dancing?" Because can I just give you some dance moves and a costume, and then you just to an extent depends. Dance like I mean, nobody's like, I'm, watching. I'm, I'm way too comfortable with humiliating myself in public, but sometimes, <laughs> sometimes I regret humiliating myself in public uh sometimes i'm proud of it like when i put on the cow costume yeah that um, was great yeah no that so so i think we put you in a costume and so vice that you versa don't feel then so i get to do the same thing with you yeah okay great okay that sounds weird and fun and yeah. thanks robert for that okay so what uh, so do you want to do you want to go to our i just picked a few yes please um that I and thought by the way, thanks nice. everyone for sending in comments and questions. Yeah, thanks guys. Um, Zev S really wants to know what we do when we're not working. Okay. What you do when you're not working, and what I do when we're not when I'm not when we're not working. Okay. Well, my work schedule is weird because I work seven days a week, 365 days a year. Mm-hmm. Like I pride myself on never taking days off. I think you once said that weekends and holidays are for the week. <laughs> I appreciate. So here's the thing. I love my job and I'm just, I don't like socializing that much. <laughs> so I love staying home, working on music, working on writing, working on activism. And when I'm not, Doing those things, I like to play with Bagel. Mm -hmm. I like to go hiking. Mm -hmm. I like to watch old episodes of 30 Rock and Family Guy. And The Simpsons. And The Simpsons. And I like to read books. That's, I I mean, I... But you also cook. You cook a lot. In order to eat, yeah. Uh, Yeah, but you're not like ordering from DoorDash. You're not buying like pre-made Amy's burritos. You are like cooking i cook every meal for myself correct like from scratch cooking yeah. that is i don't think you realize what a commitment that is and also how rare that is i have a lot of amy's burritos amy's burritos are delicious they're great i'm not i mean like door, ordering vegan food on doordash microwaving amy's burritos that's great uh bagel's trying to get something out of your bag i think but um yeah so i yeah i have nothing against any of that but i yeah, it's weird. Where did this come from? I think it started when I was first a vegan living in the abandoned factory. Like, in order to eat, I had to cook. I had no money and simple ingredients, so I had to learn how to make beans and oats, and I kind of eat the same way now. I so, think it's amazing. So, Zev S., that's when I'm not working. Lindsay has a much more interesting question because Lindsay actually likes going out into the world and socializing. Oh, I love socializing. Uh-huh. I love to go to parties and dinners and events and boy do i love a good event especially if i get to dress up and wear red lipstick and when you get to have past appetizer like oh my ve- god i love past, past apps yeah i love past apps more than almost anything i also really love an open bar even though i can't drink that much because it's just i like the vibe um and 
I love going to those kinds of things. I love going to movies sometimes, which I find to be so... <gasps> wow, Bagel, look what you got. Did you want to say something? <laughs> Do you want to say something? Do you want to talk about all the fun stuff we do? How you go everywhere with me? So just as an aside, because... Um, oh, my gosh. So yeah. while Hi. Lindsay was talking, not surprisingly, Bagel oh. jumped up to show her Because we were talking scrunchie. about all the fun stuff we do. Um, yeah. Bagel and I go on lots of really nice walks and sometimes hikes. Um, I also love to read, and I do a lot of yoga. A lot of yoga. Um so we're so we're both simple, but maybe I'm you're a little less simple because you actually go out into the world and socialize and see humans and go to parties. Yeah. And I do my best to avoid all that stuff. Yes, cuz you don't love to socialize, but we socialize like every day, you and me. It's work, but it's it's like work socializing and also the fact that we, you know, like a significant part of our work life involves Making sure Bagel is happy. Yeah, exactly. That's a big... Oh, my gosh. What so, a good girl. Oh, my God. Um, a baby. Okay, I have a, a comment here from one of our friends. Okay. And the comment was simply, as animal rights activists, can you please do more in the animal rights space? To which I say, absolutely. Like, I feel like we... We have, and I, I like the idea. We've done quite of, a lot in the animal rights space. I mean, I like the idea of creating balance. I also really like the idea of addressing. I mean, sometimes we address animal rights very directly, like you know, with Jean Bauer, um, like with Gwenna, even but with Ashley, with um, yeah. with so many of these people, and even Peter, in a way, you know, and Dan, but in their own way, talk that's about. That's what I mean. The, the the sort of the tangential way of looking at animal rights, like w with Dan Butner looking at it from a sustainability health perspective, with Peter Kalmus looking at it from a climate change perspective, with Stevo looking at it from just an ethical perspective from someone you wouldn't expect. So. And Derek Green, looking at it from the perspective of a six foot five rock god, and in even Sepultura. from Lisa, who yeah. is—it's just a very—it's just an ingrained part of her life. She does all these amazing things, but she's also committed to veganism mm -hmm. and animal activism in her own time. Yeah. So, so yes, more animal rights, absolutely. And if you have thoughts about people we should talk to and unique ways of looking at. The animal rights issue, look, whether it's from the, the animal perspective, whether it's from climate, whether it's from health, whether it's from antibiotic resistance, whether it's from water use, sustainability, all of the above, like anything we can do to talk about. And by the way, I'm just laughing because Bagel found um, from the holiday season, we had these ridiculous reindeer ears that you would wear on <laughs> Reindeer, your head. Reindeer, like furry antlers. For, for, yeah, I guess that's what they are. They're antlers, not ears. And <laughs> Bagel just found some holiday-style reindeer antlers and was dragging them around playing with them. So, it's really funny. yes, more animal rights. More animal absolutely. rights always in all aspects of our lives forever. I think we should always be trying to find more ways yeah. to infuse animal rights into literally everything that we do. Um, um, okay, now Bagel's going crazy... With oh the, wow, Bagel! You Bagel. Just, come show me your reindeer antlers. What did you get? Can I see that? Bagel. Wow, look what you did. She loves those reindeer antlers. <laughs> um, okay, so what's um, the next question comment? Okay, the next question I think is really funny. It's from Susanna Selberg. She said, "I wonder if your fantastic story about the naked mole rat will ever come back." She wants, she misses the naked mole rat story. Do you remember the naked mole rat story where we started doing, we were trying to like come up with a movie in real time. And oh, yeah. We ended up, there was like the secrets to, oh, bagel. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Oh, my God. Um, like the secret to human life was in the DNA of the naked mole rat. Yeah. And this, you know, woman came across it. So, yes, we'll absolutely um, revisit. I, I mean, I love, we, we only kind of did that once, but revisiting storytelling. Like, why don't we start maybe not every episode, but start like, why, just like create a little ongoing story. That is ongoing and a story. Yeah, uh -oh. I think let's do it. I think it's really fun. And I, a couple people have asked me about when we're going to do it again. So we'll do that again. Thanks, Susanna, for bringing that up. Um, By the way, just as an aside, uh, 
So Bagel has an alter ego named Liam. Do you want to say why? The reason Bagel's alter ego is called Liam is because your mom, for Christmas, got you a bagel doormat that says, be, it's supposed to say, beware of bagel. But they, so it's Bagel's picture, <laughs> but the generic text on it when she ordered it was beware of Liam and she forgot to change it. So now you have <laughs> a doormat at your house that says beware of Liam with a bagel looking kind of menacing underneath. So when bagel gets feisty and wants to play feisty style, that's her alter ego. She becomes Liam. She becomes Liam. And she was just doing it after Liam. getting all excited with her reindeer antler Liam, ears. So crazy. Okay. Okay, here's our next one. Because, boy, I, I, we still have to listen to the musical version of yeah, the Yeah, we've epic got a poem. lot, but that's okay. Um, maybe it's just a long episode, and that's all right. Okay, here's a question that I think might have a fun answer, which is, have you thought of periodically taking the show on the road for live in audience experiences? Alicia Arredondo asked. Yes, the road most likely will consist of going to places in and around Los Angeles because I'm kind of provincial. Or in New York because Possib we also yeah, that's, go that's, there that's often. That's a good idea. We could go to New York. Um, but we actually have a couple on the road live Moby Pods coming up. Uh, we just don't have specific dates yet. So once we have specific dates, you guys will be the first to know. A hundred percent. Um Here's something, Bill Leonard, who has become, is just such a great friend of the pod and chimes in a lot and always has really interesting things to say. He has something I don't know, I've never really thought about, and I wonder if you've thought about it, but he he's apparently a very sensitive vegan and gets upset when people talk about eating meat, whatever. So he asked, are there any books that are vegan-friendly fiction or nonfiction that like don't talk about animals um, or hurting them like vegan friendly fiction hmm um, I don't know I, I mean I can't think of anything and I was wondering if you could think I of mean something. in the world of movies I can think of so like there's Babe and there's some of the Ardman entertainment mm -hmm. movies uh, Okja um, but yeah, in the world of fiction, I mean, obviously there's a lot of fiction that doesn't mention animals at all, but by exclusion, that doesn't mean it's animal friendly, just there aren't animals in it. Mm -hmm. uh, Omission is tantamount to <laughs> violence. Yeah. So no, that's a, that's a wonderful question. I can't. I, I think it's such a good question because I never really thought about it before of like vegan friendly by just a story that is aware and compassionate towards yeah. animals without necessarily being a, a book about veganism or a book about uh, animal rights. Yeah, that's what an interesting perspective and question. Thanks. Oh, thanks, Bill Leonard. Um, oh, here's one that I thought was really fun from Neil Kolkun. Kolkun? He asked, are there any thoughts about making songs created in the podcast available somewhere like the Moby Pod songs that all live in one place? That's a great idea. I'm embarrassed to say that's the first time it's ever kind of crossed my mind. So yes, we have a bunch of Moby Pod songs that we're that we just keep and they're all ridiculous. They're but all yeah, absurd. We definitely we have them and at some point we should definitely make a Spotify playlist or something with the Moby Pod songs. And if if the musical version of the epic poem is worth including, then we'll include that as well. Amazing. Great. I just thought that was really that was really funny. Um, oh, and Julie Bickerstaff thinks that we should podcast about books that changed our life. Great idea. Let's do a book episode. I think that's a really, really interesting idea. Fantastic idea. Let, let's... Let's just do, and maybe, okay, so here to that end, if people can send in books that have changed their lives, so we can actually like. Yeah, I think that's a really, really cool idea too. And our friends and should our friends, write them in. And our friends, but like, yeah, you know, it's funny. I, actually, I, I was having that text conversation with some friends earlier um, about, you know, the, the media books, 
music, movies, things that have changed our lives. So mm-hmm. we def- I'd love to do that. Yeah, great. Me too. Except for the fact that I actually can't read. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, I went to public school in Texas and they don't teach that there. Um, I mean, I don't want to throw you under the bus, but you were just reading. <laughs> I actually memorized it. Okay. Um, and I was just well, acting like I was reading. So you for, I, I mean, I, I know that there are more questions and there are more comments. There were a lot more. I just picked, I just picked a few so that we don't have like a three hour episode. Okay. Um, but, and from people that um, are very active in our inbox at MobyPod at Moby.com. And then one of our other friends sent through a sort of like two word Ex- with an exclamation point suggestion, which was just more bagel, which of course, yeah, no, a hundred percent, yes, always. But yeah, there's did one you hear problem: that you? is, of course, we film these episodes and we put them up for free on the YouTubes and elsewhere. But for, I mean, like ninety percent of the audience is listening and audio by definition. It's a podcast. Bagel is many things. She is not, and I don't. I I, I want to say this in the most respectful way. Um, speaking English words is not her strong suit. Yeah, she's not. She doesn't speak a language that is widely available or understandable by yeah. by human beings. I speak bagel. I speak bagelese. I talk to bagel all the time, and she talks back. But it tends to just be sort of like the equivalent of. Me going, <laughs> and she looks at me and she goes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's our conversations. And also there's the soulful looking into each other's eyes conversations. Mm-hmm, like there's mm-hmm. tons of communication, but it's not the sort of communication that necessarily works with a podcast that is language oriented. I mean, we have our own language where there's a, there's a way that she will approach me when she has to go to the bathroom. There's a way that she will approach me when she wants a treat. There's a way that she'll approach me when she wants me to sit on the couch with her. Mm -hmm. Um, And these are all three things that she needs quite often. Um, But also she approaches me differently if she wants different kinds of treats. Yeah. Um, So, you know, we have, we have our shared language, you know, but again, we would love to do nothing more. I mean, if it was up to me, the entire podcast would just be about bagel. I know, we, yeah. But there's not much apart from sitting here and being adorable that she can offer in terms of l- language. I mean, we could do a whole bagel episode where we just talk about bagel and maybe there's a bagel song. Yeah. If you want. That's a great idea. So Throwing it out there. Um, and speaking of songs, so let me go and... In the world of podcasting, I'll be back in two seconds, but I'm going to go add musical accompaniment slash orchestration to your epic poem. But wait, I have a question Uh before we before we go away, which is I would love to know some of your favorite moments from this year of pod. I feel like we got really lucky with the diversity and the intelligence and the open mindedness you know, the open-minded nature of the people we've spoken to. I, I couldn't agree more. Though I have to say, I mean, obviously our guest episodes were one thing, but there were a lot of episodes that were just us where we did some dumb, dumb, dummy, dumb stuff. Dumb in a good way, though. But like, because like, remember when you sang the song to the aliens asking them not to kill us? Yeah, you wrote that song. Yeah, that was really fun. You were really, you're really good at party songs. Well, going, yeah, going, putting on... Um, space costumes and making our friends dress up in space costumes <laughs> and sitting on Laura and Darren's deck, a.k.a. Spaceport, and filming that episode. That was, yeah, that was really fun. That was really, really fun. I loved that. Even though I was really nervous because I'm not used to being in front of people because I'm not um, a rock star who's been touring for um, 30 years. So I don't, I get nervous when I go in front of people, but I got very comfortable very fast because you're very good at making me feel comfortable because you are so like unaffected. You just don't get nervous in front of crowds. In front of crowds. Yeah. Yeah. The one thing I will contextualize that particular episode is one of the most interesting aspects of it was before going to Lauren Darren's. So we ordered a ton of vegan pizza for everyone. (laughs) But we also had to get drinks. So you and Bagel and I (laughs) went to a huge 
rundown, dirty supermarket in Los Angeles. I don't want to name names because... I think we named it on the episode. Okay. <laughs> but we, we went to this big, messy, dirty, incredibly crowded supermarket to buy all the drinks. And I don't think we realized how much drinks weigh. Like we're buying like bottles of soda and bottles of water. Because we didn't want to and, buy plastic, so we yeah. only brought bought aluminum and glass. And that, in hindsight, I realized... We could have just, it, they're like all these services could have, like, that Instacart like. Instacart it or. Like, yeah, like, like Instacart could have brought it to the spaceport. And so just that moment of like. We were so stressed. It was so hard and stressful for us. And it, but it's kind of made me happy as well in that like we are, we were the on screen talent, we're the on air talent. We were the ones like most people would be preparing by like, okay, like what are we going to talk about? What's our script? And instead we're standing in a 45 minute line <laughs> at this rundown dirty supermarket to buy grape soda and metal cans. Yep. That was crazy. Um, but also I forgot, we ordered all this pizza and I forgot to get plates and forks and stuff. I got salad. I didn't bring forks. So that was a weird thing that I did. Um, but <laughs> also, but I loved that. I thought it was so fun. And I also have to say, I really loved the episodes where we wrote songs. Yeah, because let's I, do more of that. I, well, it's, it was very novel for me because I have never written a song before. Okay, so I have an idea. And we've, it's sort of your idea, but I'm going to, say it so I'm, I'm gonna give you credit for it you had this idea of we write a song but then we get different people to perform it on moby pod mm -hmm. so let's have a party and we're going to you and i will write a song and then we'll get some of our friends to perform it and it won't be a competition because there won't necessarily be a winner but we can almost just sort of see how people interpret the song so instead of us playing the song other people will play the song I think that's a wonderful idea, but I do think that it should be a competition and there should be a winner because nothing's more fun than pitting friends against one another. Yeah, what if, in, what if everybody what if everybody who enters wins a different type of pro? Like, like we, can, <laughs> yeah. we can invent, like, like San Francisco grade school style, invent just sort of like made up prizes. I think that's a wonderful idea. Like someone gets a potato with a crown on it. Ooh. Yeah. Okay, so let me go because I'm going to go orchestrate your epic poem, and then we will reconvene in the world of podcasting in about two seconds. But in the, my actual world, it's going to be 24 hours. I can't wait. Okay, so 24 hours begins now, and in the world of podcasting, it will be two seconds. Here we go now. Okay, so we're back. Guess who's back? Oh, no, that's and, Eminem. We don't talk about Eminem. And uh, hopefully in the world of podcast listening... This gap will have been approximately three seconds long. If not. But what I've done since last we spoke is, and anyone watching can recognize that um, we look one day older and we're wearing different clothes. Mm -hmm. And bagel, bagel. And I sound different. I probably sound more mature than I did yesterday. Yeah, you definitely, like, you've learned a lot in the last 24 hours. I did, actually. Hi. <laughs> Bagel. Bagel's trying to stick her nose in my nose. Bagel, why are you trying to put noses in noses? So, okay, so what I've done over the last, I guess oh. it now like 22 hours, is taken your epic poem and put music to it. Okay. And I also did my own version of it. Hi. <laughs> Hi. I'm very distracted. Because Bagel is being extra frantic. Okay, so you also did, you did your own, like I did, you, you recited the poem. Yes. And so we have to put on headphones to listen. Okay, let's do it. Um, Are we doing this right now? Sure. I'm not quite sure how I'm going to do it. I've got the, the music. Do you need this mouse? At some point, but not, not right now. But yeah. Should we just shift it over? Uh, no, the, it. Um, Look at no, all these I, mouse pads you have. <laughs> what a, wow, what an interesting conversationalist you are. <laughs> wow, you sure have a lot of mouse pads. <laughs> Wait, yep, that's hold on, why. you recycle your paper bags from the <laughs> supermarket? Yep, that's hey, why I do here. so well on the dating scene. Are you ready? Um, yes, I'm okay, ready. Okay, so in about a couple of seconds, the first one is going to play. 
Okay. And the first one is supposed to be very pretty. Okay. You ready? Yeah, let's do it. Here goes. Okay. 365 short days ago, Lindsay and Bagel approached their friend, Mo. The people need more than just your great songs. Your voice has a place in the podcasting throngs. So Moby considered, but at first he doubted. Why take up more space in a, in a place that's so crowded? But Lindsay and Bagel pushed him to try it. You've got cool things to say. No need to keep quiet. <laughs> okay, so that's the first one. Okay, I like it. I like the kind of like, if it's like a Robin Hood. Uh, um, what's the part before a play called? And now here comes the second one, which is much more electronic. Okay. Ready? Ooh. The badass. <laughs> and I put some crazy modern processing on your voice. 365 short days ago, Lindsay and Bagel approached their friend Mo. The people need more than just your great songs. Your voice has a place in the podcasting throngs. So Moby considered, but at first he doubted. Why take up more space in a, in a place that's so crowded? But Lindsay modern, and Bagel right? pushed him to so try modern. it. So modern, it's like, cool it sounds like a speech say. before no I go to, to space. Keep quiet. <laughs> quiet. 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 Whoa! <laughs> quiet. Remix. <laughs> okay. Okay, that is so, here, so fun. Do, can you take Bagel so I can stand up? Come here, Bagel. Okay. Oh, there we go. Um, okay, so oh, here's sh- the okay. third one, which is, I believe, the punk rock version. Ooh, okay. Uh, well, you say that, but you haven't heard it yet, so it might be terrible. Well. Okay, you ready? Here's yeah. the punk rock version. <gasps> 365 short days ago, Lindsay and Bagel approached their friend, Mo. The people need more than just your great songs. Your voice has a place in the podcasting throngs. So Moby considered, but at first he doubted. Why take up more space in in a place that's so crowded? But Lindsay and Bagel pushed him to try it. You've got cool things to say. No need to keep quiet. We wanted to start with something quite showy, so we kicked the pot off with tales about Bowie. I guess it was stressful to enter the fray, so next up was some tips for our anxiety. Our film punk rock vegan movie had just graced the screen, so we spoke to its star, the great Derek Green. Okay, Okay. I like that. So that's the punk rock one. Now you want to hear my version of it? Uh, Desperately. I did it. I did a scary version. Ooh! Like it's kind of, you'll you'll hear it's very ominous. Okay, okay, okay. I'm very excited. 365 short days ago. (laughs) Lindsay and Babe <laughs> approached their friend Mo. <laughs> the people need more than just your great songs. Your voice has a place in the podcaster's throne. Oh my so God! Considered, or at first he doubted. What's gonna happen? I take up more space in a place so crowded. But Lindsay and Babe pushed him to try it. <laughs> You've got cool things to say. <laughs> yes, that's my scary oh. version. Okay, so then I did one because I know you like indie rock. I do. And you like gentle, happy guitars. I do. So I thought we would end with one that's just sort of uplifting and happy. Okay. The one caveat, it, it, it involves the whole poem. So it's about three minutes long. Should we just listen to it? Yeah. Yeah, let's do it. So this is this is this is the one that I think is like the others are hopefully delightful and ridiculous, but this one I actually like a little bit more. Okay, great. Three hundred and sixty-five short days ago, Lindsay and Bagel approached their friend Mo. Yeah. The people need more than just your great songs. Your voice has a place in the podcasting throngs. So Moby considered, but at first he doubted. Why take up more space in a, in a place that's so crowded? But Lindsay and Bagel pushed him to try it. You've got cool things to say. No need to keep quiet. We wanted to start with something quite showy, so we kicked the pot off with tales about Bowie. I guess it was stressful to enter the fray, so next up was some tips for our anxiety. 
Our film punk rock vegan movie had just graced the screen, so we spoke to its star, the great Derek Green. Next was the actor, New York's party queen, the prolific painter, Lisa Edelstein. When fiending for fighting, a fact war was waged. Just a few battles, but more will be staged. Then there was the time demons damaged our mic. Rachel Stavis fought back with a light counter-strike. If you want to live healthier long past 100, Dan Buettner can help, and his hotness abundant. <laughs> Um, if you want to make choices for a better planet, Ed Bagley Jr. is here to help you plan it. <laughs> See, the music's changing. Dude. Yeah, yeah, we yeah, yeah. There's a real evolution happening. ambient music. If it makes a sound, Moby can produce it. There was quantum mechanics and bad pickup lines. We even took a journey through Moe's vegan time. The soft side of Steve-O had us enamored, gentle and funny, and now never hammered. <laughs> <laughs> Peter Kalmus had once chained himself to a bank. Would you rather survive or fill your gas tank? We wrote two cool songs about sadness and crying, and one about aliens, earth occupying. Dr. Kristen Thompson preached psychiatry. We told stories of storms and sobriety. Our, fun, our friend Gwenna Hunter makes LA way better. Her cool vegan food bank is quite the joy spreader. Nobody saves animals quite like Gene Bauer. We were so impressed with his compassionate power. You'd think the next guest was demonic Poseidon, but he's just a sober civilian, our friend Hunter Biden. We had so much fun with the sweet Ashley Jackson, a busy Gen Zer, can't catch her relaxing. <laughs> We chose meditation to end 23, shockingly thankful Bagel Moby and me. While we hoped Moby Pod would inspire and beguile, it's our listeners who've joined us that made it all worthwhile. I love that. That's really beautiful, Mo, what you did. <laughs> I um, love you can that. Take, you can take off your headphones, I think. Okay, so that's the one I thought was the nicest and probably most um, relevant for your lovely epic poem. I love that. That was so beautiful. Oh, good. You ha you used a lot of instruments. <laughs> 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 yep. <laughs> yeah, there's, a, there's two guitars and an organ and a piano and a bass and drums and strings and... It was beautiful. Yeah. Like, it felt like a very, like... like um, a very well populated, beautiful orchestration. Well, thanks. You really are a one man band. <laughs> That's so, amazing. That was actually very beautiful. Like whatever my put the poem was silly, but that music was really beautiful. <laughs> oh, well, great. <laughs> um, so should we? Should we? We've been talking for quite a long time now. Well, yeah, yeah. It doesn't feel like it to us now, but boy, did we talk a lot yesterday. Uh, and so, should we say goodbye and thank you to? Everybody? Yeah, yeah. But I do want to say something that's maybe, I don't know, overly earnest, which is I do have a lot of gratitude for this podcast and getting to do this podcast with you. It's really, really fun, and it's a really fun thing to do with you, my friend, and it's a cool, wonderful adventure that we've gotten to go on together and with Bagel, and I'm very, very grateful for that. So I just want to extend my gratitude to you. Well, I feel the exact same way. Um, and I am, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but like most new podcasts are very specific. Mm -hmm. You know, it's about one specific thing or one specific idea. And it, it seems commercially counterintuitive to have a podcast that tries to contain everything. Mm -hmm. But it's made it so much more interesting, I think. You yeah. know, when when we came up with the list of all the stuff, like the things that you mentioned in your epic poem, I was like, wow, it's only been a year. <laughs> and we've talked to all these people and been ridiculous and earnest and tried to save the world while also being goofballs. Yeah, that's so, the goal. So, yeah, so I'm very, I, I, as we've said a few times, like I love doing this and I think there's something really just like as a medium podcasting can be really special. Mm -hmm. and it's also the directness of it. Like yeah. there's no one else involved. Like we're not going 
through another company. We're not going through you know, no one's having editorial input. Advertisers aren't telling us what to say or mm-hmm. do. We just get to communicate directly with each other and with the people who are listening. Yeah, we are only influenced by the things that we care about most and the people that engage with us that have been listening to the podcast. And it's really nice, which leads me to my next kind of earnest gratitude sentiment, which is the the people that listen and the people that engage with us, especially on our email. We get a lot of amazing, thoughtful, sweet emails with interesting things and suggestions and ideas. And it's just, it's so cool to see people engage. And so that has been another great Yep. Part of it. 100% is, I agree. Is getting to kind of build those relationships with the people that care about the same stuff that, that we care about. Um, and I also want to say thank you to Jonathan Nezvadba, but in a more uh, detailed way than I usually do. Because he edits every single episode of this podcast. He does it all himself. He does all of the fancy sound fixing <laughs> stuff that I don't know what it is. Mm-hmm. What's it called? Uh, well, it's... Usually equalization and yeah. compression. Yes, and, ed- and editing as well, because mm-hmm. we have a lot more ums and uhs and pauses. So someone listening to us might think that we're that we have like phenomenal elocution. And the truth is, it's just Jonathan making us sound good. It's Jonathan being incredibly detail oriented and obsessive about making the podcast great. So I just want to say he's Jonathan has done such a great job, and I know he's editing this right now. So don't you edit this out, Jonathan? Yep. But you, Jonathan has done such a wonderful job, and this podcast would not be what it is without the long hours that he puts in to, to, make, it, to make it what it has become. And I also want to say thank you to Mike Formansky, who is who edits the video and does all of our video stuff. He's done an amazing job. He's such a talented person. He also does all of like the graphics. So the the um, thumbnail that you see, Mike made that as well. And so Mike's talent has made this also what it is. And I also want to say thank you to Human Content, who has helped us in so many ways. Yes, they distribute the podcast, but they're also wonderful friends and have given us wonderful advice and guidance as we've been trying to figure out how to do this. Um, so a huge thank you to them as well, to to Aaron and Shanti and Rob at Human Content. And I also want to say thank you to Bagel, who is our mascot and our bestie and makes life better and richer. Yeah. Um, I agree with all of those things. And then just to repeat what you said, to everyone who takes the time to listen and respond, just thank you. Because it's like, I mean, I tend to be a fairly isolated person, (laughs) but there's something really nice about community, even Mm -hmm. if it's virtual community. You know, like, I mean, we're a a communal species Mm -hmm. and we thrive when we're engaging with each other just as long as it's not like, Black Friday at a shopping mall after Thanksgiving (laughs) or at a NASCAR event. Yep. Uh, So thank you for joining us and listening and engaging. And so I just wanted to also quickly say some of the things that we have coming up. So we're going to be doing a couple of live podcast events. We don't have specific dates, but one is going to be around the anniversary of the punk rock vegan movie. And the other is going to be the end of the 25th anniversary of the release of the album Play. So we're going to do sort of like an acoustic set of songs from Play and a look back at like the weird phenomena, how Play came to be, what was going on in the world, what was going on with me. We'll have guests and guest musicians. Mm-hmm. So that's coming up. And what I'd like to do is announce those here so the people listening will have first dibs on tickets. Yes, absolutely. I think that's a great idea. So if, you know, you can grab those tickets. Hopefully, if you don't live in L.A., you can come and hang. Because I remember last time we did the live podcast, people came from all over. Mm-hmm. Um, and and, that, and we, weren't, we weren't even selling tickets. That I was know. Just like, those were just a giveaway. So yeah. this people will have a chance to actually buy them and figure out how to get here. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's very, very exciting. I'm yeah. really excited about that. And once we that. know more... Everyone listening will know more and you'll know first. So stand by for that. That's coming soon. And then, 
yeah, we said thank you so many times, but just once again, thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Bagel. Thanks, Jonathan, Mike, and Human Content. And thanks to everybody who's listening. And we'll talk to you in a couple weeks. And thanks, Moby, for Mobian. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. You had to end on a ridiculous note. Yeah. <laughs>